Good morning, First Church. <laughs> Got some excited folks in the very back here. Why don't you guys stand up? We are going to worship the Lord this morning. Lord, we come before you this morning, and we just say thank you. Lord, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for who you are. We thank you that we have the opportunity to just gather together, Lord, and worship your name, Lord, and lift you up, Lord, in spirit and in truth. God, we just ask that whatever else is going on in our lives, God, that right now, for this time, Lord, we would put that to the side, Lord, and make this time about you. Lord, you are the reason we're here. We love you. And we just want to worship you with everything that we have this morning, God. We ask that you would be lifted up and glorified, Lord, and we ask that your will would be done. In your name we pray, amen.
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. How you come to the end of yourself? And do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. And bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. And Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen, Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ the precious blood of Jesus Christ and bear your cross as you wait for the crown and tell the world of the treasure you found. You may be seated. I want to welcome you this morning, First Church Ministries. We're glad you're here to worship with us. We, uh, we have something we say, it's like a mission. It's not a mission statement, it's just a motto. Everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything is possible 
when Jesus, when God is involved. This is something we truly believe, that when God gets involved in things, lives change, people change. And, and it change, it's a change that comes from the inside out. And that's why, even as we just sang, Jesus is calling. It, we're in the book of Hebrews, and in, in Hebrews chapter 4, we saw that Jesus is calling. He's calling people, those that are struggling, those that are doing great, and everybody in between. He's calling us. He's saying, I have a rest for you. I have something for you that's here and now and goes into the future, this eternal life that I give. And... Um, it's that whole thing, you know, of the two words for life, bios and zoe. Bios is physical life. It's simply existing. And, and Scripture uses that for people that are just alive. But Jesus came and said, I have a life for you. And he uses a different word. He used the word zoe. The word zoe means a life of meaning, a life of purpose, a life that accomplishes something, a life that you were made for. And Jesus then tacks on eternal zoe eternal life to that phrase to say that it's a life that's here and now but it's a life that just bleeds right into the future and transitions right into eternity i have this life for you i have this rest for you jesus is calling there's no one in this room he is not calling he's calling right now he's calling for those to make that initial response. He's calling for others to make another response, to grow further and grow deeper in, in your walk with Jesus Christ. As we continue, we encourage you, if you'd like to stand, feel free to stand. If you want to remain seated, feel free to remain seated. But we want you to worship. We want you to think about what we're singing. What does that mean? What does that mean about God? And what does it mean about me? Let's continue to do that together. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy all around. Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. And there is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Unto the Lamb, honor and glory, that worthy is He who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power, He is alive, the stone is rolled away, all our worship and all our worship will belong to him forever death is conquered and our savior holds the key and there is a name that reigns above all others jesus christ the king above all kings It won't be long We will behold him And every tear He'll wipe away We'll
will be at home The war will be over And soon we will meet Our Savior face to face And every burden Will be lifted in His presence Every trophy Will be laid down at His feet and there is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. All our worship, all our worship will belong to you forever. Holy, holy, for all eternity. Yours is the name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. So I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am your And you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters Your sovereign hand will be my guide Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me You never fail and you won't start now so I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine oh, trust is without borders 
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours And you are mine We're going to take a short break as we change things around, but just before we do, I just want to mention if this is your first time or you've never done this before, we'd love to have you fill out one of these cards. You drop it in the little basket in the back and we just send you a note saying thank you for coming and a little gift card for a cup of coffee, and that's about it. And it just hit me that we've set up, because of we're doing the chili cook-off, we set up alternative chairs and there's no visitor cards in those black chairs. You have to actually steal one from someone in these other chairs if you'd like to do it, all right? And we're going to take a short break, get another cup of coffee, run to the restroom, whatever, get a drink, and then we'll call you right back in a moment, all right? Let's do that. Thank you. All right. We're going to ask you to get back to your seats unless you're in line for a cup of coffee. If you're in line for a cup of coffee, that supersedes all previous requirements. You can get your coffee and sit down. Those of you that are at home, you've had time to get your coffee, so sit down. All right, just so they get that straight. Um, we have a number of announcements we want to mention, um, just different things going on, and we're going to be start, start having volleyball nights every Monday at 7 p.m., starting tomorrow. If you want to just play some volleyball, you come by the church, 7 p.m., it'll be all set up, and uh, you can have a, just have a good time. If you have questions, you can see Joseph Boinga. He's got answers. All right. This Tuesday at Noel West House, we have a men's fellowship. If you're not sure about that, you can call us, contact us, or just grab me afterwards, and, and I'll, I'll make sure you understand what, where you need to be and what time. It's at 6.30 p.m. Tuesday at Noel West House for uh, a time of fellowship and just uh, enjoying each other. We have our children's church fall party next Sunday during the normal service time. So if you've got small kids, they've got information for you on that, um, and you can see them as you leave. We have a men's breakfast Saturday, October the 28th at 8.30. This coming Saturday, 8.30 here, 
Uh, we get together, we cook a big breakfast, um, somebody gets up and shares a devotional, and we spend time together, and it's just, it's just an enjoyable time. Uh, our young adults are having a weekend away, Friends Giving Weekend Away, November 9th through 12th at Lake Gaston. So you can see uh, Brianna or Seth or give us a call and we can connect you to them. That won't be any problem at all and we'd love to have you be involved in that. We have received, okay, this takes a little bit. Uh, there, there is, if you go anywhere on the peninsula or all over the place, you'll see different places talking about angel tree. And I don't know how this works because there's two different angel trees. We are involved in angel tree that, how do I say this? The other angel trees are great. I'm not... De- denigrating them. I just want to make sure you understand that. They give to uh, families that are, are uh, di- in difficult situations, blah, blah, blah. All right, you know how that works. Angel Tree that we work with works through Prison Fellowship. Prison Fellowship does uh, Bible studies and, 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 and different sorts of programs for people who are incarcerated. Prison Fellowships, uh, what their goal is to when the incarceration is over, to reunite the family so that families come back together and function the way they're supposed to function. And so what they do is they work in the prison with men and with women. They do Bible studies. They, they do oftentimes, especially as they get close to getting out, they have all these uh, different uh, things they can, t- just in terms of teaching them about finding jobs, teaching them about responsible behavior, teaching them about how things work, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. What they also do is they work with the family that is not in prison. They work with the children. And they offer them, children of incarcerated people, they give them a week at camp in the summertime. They give them mun- uh, mentoring, mentoring during, you know, I've just noticed it just happens every week now that I get all convoluted. So it's not like it's unusual. They do mentoring for these children uh, through the fall and the, all the way till the summertime. And then they offer them camp. And then one of the things they do is they have Angel Tree Christmas and that is where we come in. We come in, and they will give us names, all right? They'll give us a name, and they'll give us two presents to buy. One is an article of clothing, and one is something the child <laughs> really wants, all right? Okay? And so it's a toy or something like that and an article of clothing, and it is reasonably priced. You are not going to spend an outrageous amount. They don't want you to spend an outrageous amount, all right? So then these two presents, you wrap them. Then we come back here with them. Then we take them to the homes of the children whose parent is incarcerated. And the gifts, oh, I love that. The gifts are given to the child in the name of the parent who is incarcerated. So that parent, though he has, she has nothing, can say, I, I was able to you know, give a gift to my son, my daughter. It's a really incredible ministry. It's one small bit of this huge ministry, Prison Fellowship, that is going on worldwide. It's an incredible ministry. If you, I encourage you to look it up if you want to. It's, it's, it's incredible. And this is one small part of bringing healing to families. And this is all a part of their plan as they guide these people through the prison system and then out and in, in, then functioning in society in a wholesome way, in a way that honors God and, and keeps the family together. So that was the longest announcement in the world right there. So we now have the names of children. We've gotten from Angel Tree the names of the children that we are going to be buying presents for. In the next week or so, you'll start to see sign-up sheets. You'll see things that help you understand what, what you're doing, how to do it. Um, and we encourage you to, to take advantage of that. Um, when my kids were younger, I took them with me to give presents to these kids. And it, some of them talk about it to this day, how, how they remember going and doing that. It's a, it's a powerful thing to be able to do. We also could use help with our angel tree ministry. It is, it is, there's a lot of work that goes on in sorting and getting things straight, keeping track of who has who, you know, reminding people presents have to be in by this time, different things like that. If you, and I, I mentioned this about a month or so ago, and I know someone came up to me, and then I right away forgot who it was. So uh, if it's you, come up to me again, this time with your name written on a three by five card. But if you would like to help or be involved, uh, we would love to have you help us in this. 
um, in a little ways or big ways. We could use help with the Angel Tree Ministries. The, the most important, oh, this is, here comes the bus. See Jose. There you go. That's the most important person to see. He has a better memory than I do. He's more organized than I am. Okay? So that's uh, Angel Tree Ministries. These are the things that we feel are incredibly important, and we want you to be involved. All right? So we're in a series on the book of Hebrews, and it has been going on uh, for a number of weeks now. And the writer of the book of Hebrews has been giving arguments. He's been, he's been, it's like a court case. Think of it like a court case. He's, he's dealing with people, and, and I was just thinking about that as we were singing. We have people in our congregation that are going through deep waters. And he's dealing, this book is written for people who are struggling. And uh, he, he's, he's, he's talking to them, people who are struggling, people who are trying to hang in there, people who are looking to grow more in Jesus. And, and I want to say this, so, so some of you really need this right now. And some of you, it's not so much an issue for you right now. But just let me just, uh, grandfatherly advice. It will be an issue. You will go through deep waters. It's a part of life. And what we're trying to do here, and what the writer of the book of Hebrews is trying to do here, is to prepare people for it. To prepare them for it as they, as they struggle. So it's like a court case. It's showing our need of Jesus. It's showing that nothing else compares to Jesus at all. Nothing comes close. And the writer has brought out the point that Jesus is the high priest. So he's going to do a deep dive on the priesthood. And it's going to be today and, and, uh, today, and also next week and maybe the next, it's, it's, he's, it keeps going. He's going to really talk about this quite a bit. And it, we have to understand something. We have to understand, and we talk about this all the time, we have to understand who this is being written to. It's the book to Hebrews. So it, these are people who are steeped in the Old Testament. They understand. So when he starts talking about a high priest, their, their visions, they know, they've been, they've seen the temple. This is written probably around in the early 60s, AD, or early 60s. So the temple has not been destroyed yet. The temple gets destroyed around AD 70, 71, right in that range. So the temple has not been destroyed yet. So they, they've seen it. They've been there. They've seen the temple. And he's going to start using this imagery. The problem is we haven't seen it. The imagery is not as vivid for us. But as we talk about this, this great high priest, he's going to bring up these images that they have because the temple worship is still going. They're going to think about the temple. They're going to think about the holy place. They're going to think about altars. Let me just, I got a few pictures. This is a reproduction of the temple. Now, you have to understand scale here. Uh, They estimate 20, 30,000 people could be in those courts around uh, with all those, all those columns there. And then as you look at it, you see they go into the lower section, the, the section, and, and, and then as they move in, they get into the holy place and then the holy of holies that's only entered once a year. And so this is what they'd be thinking of. They'd be thinking this is an artist's, artist's reproduction, but they'd be thinking of things like this, right? They'd be thinking of altars and tables and candles and incense, and they'd think of the, of the priest. And then there was this curtain, this veil that separated them from the holy of holies that it could only be entered once a year on the day of atonement. When, when atonement is made for the sins of the nation of Israel. And they would be thinking about all of this and over to the right from the priest is the showbread and all this kind of stuff would be vivid in their mind because they've seen it. They've lived it. And this imagery is all connected with a high priest. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, we have a better high priest than the high priest. The one that's in Jerusalem right now. There's a better high priest than him. Jesus is the fulfillment of, of all this imagery. He's the fulfillment of all this imagery that they have in their minds, and he's he's telling them. All this imagery points to Jesus. When they would sacrifice a lamb for sins, this is an image of the lamb someday that would come and be sacrificed for good. No more sacrifices needed, a once for all sacrifice. And I mentioned this last week, we saw when we studied the book of John where um, <clears throat> suddenly, you know, it, it, uh, Jesus comes along and 
Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, there he is, right there. And so this is, this is what he's arguing here. He's telling them he's going to continue in Hebrews 5. He's already started it. We looked at it last week. He's going to t- continue in Hebrews 5 by, by reminding them of things about the high priest. Reminding them of things they already know. And it helps them as the, the readers to inform them of the aspects of the high, high priest. And it helps us to inform us of things we might not know. Now this, this is used throughout the Bible, this whole idea of reminding God continually says to his people and to us, remember, remember. You, you, you can do a word study, remember comes up all the time. Remember, I'm reminding you, remember. In, 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 uh, in, the, book of, in the book of 2 Peter, Peter says, I'm saying this to you again. I, I know how that is. I understand. You know, um, my kids sometimes, my kids are just such encouragers when they talk about sermons that I do in church. And I'm saying that not truthfully. Um, And they will say, Dad, that story, you said it a couple of years ago. It's getting old. You keep using it. Stop using that story. Or they say, Dad, that joke, okay, too many times. Not funny anymore. And I would say, not funny. A bunch of people laughed. And they would say, courtesy laugh, Dad. They're just trying not to hurt your feelings. So thank you for trying not to hurt my feelings. And I do understand that sometimes I repeat myself. If you, we're in the book of Hebrews, you're going to hear a lot of this stuff over and over and over because it's important. But here's the reason. It's important because we need to know this. This isn't something that is like, oh, Bob, great message. Thank you so much. And then you walk out of here and you'll never need it again. You will need it. We're talking about eternity here. We're talking about things that matter. So... What is the first thing he's going to talk to them about? He's going to say to them, there are the requirements to be the high priest. They probably know them, but he's rehearsing it with them. And this is great for us, the people who may not know them at all. All right. So the first requirement that he's going to mention, oh, I didn't even read the scripture. This shows how I'm getting terrible. My kids would really rake me over the coals for this. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. All right. You can follow along in your Bible, on your phone, or just listen as I read it. And just notice how he's going to be talking about high priest and the priesthood and all these things. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant or are going ast- or, and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when, it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Excuse me. All right, so... First of all, requirements of the high priest, solidarity is required. And we saw that at the very first verse. It said every high priest is selected from among among the people. All right, he's, 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 and he's, this is a court case. He's already dealing with something that he knows they are wrestling with. There were in some of the Jewish sects, especially the S-E-C-T-S's, especially the, um, the Essenes and some of the very conservative Pharisees, there was this belief that after the Messiah came, an angel, Michael the archangel, would rule. He would rule. He would be in charge. He would be the mediator between God and man. And what is he saying here? Every high priest is selected from among the people. No angel can take that job. It had to be a human being. The mediator, the high priest, has to be 
one of us. And this is the reason, I mean, this is the reason for the incarnation of Jesus Christ, among others. But this is the reason. He is one of us. That's a powerful, powerful statement. He lived the perfect life in our place because we were not able to. He died in our place. Romans 5 tells us God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ became one of us. Why? Because he loved us so much. Jesus was a person just like you and just like me. Second thing, the requirements to be the high priest. Solidarity, one of us. Second, selection is required. This was in verses one and two here. Uh, one and four actually brings it out. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So it's very key here. They were, they were appointed, not elected. All right? They were appointed as high priests. God had a selection process for the high priest. He said, first of all, it has to be from the tribe of Levi. Levi is the priestly tribe. And second of all, it mentions here, it has to be, in verse 4, called by God, just as Aaron was. It has to be from the house of Aaron. If you're going to be a high priest, it's not enough that you're a Levite. You have to be from the house of Aaron. And that winnowed it down. So that was part of the selection. And this is why, I mean, for so many things, this is why genealogies are so important to them. Genealogies establish who I am by who I've come from. I'm from this house. I'm from this tribe. That was so important to them because so many things were involved in that. Ownership of land, all kinds of things were involved in that. And so they, 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 were, they kept careful, tra careful track of their genealogies. And so God chooses his leaders. He chooses his leaders. It's a calling. You know, Mark 10, there's a great illustration of this. James and John, they come to Jesus. If you remember this, this is, this is one of those times where it could get a little awkward for the disciples. James and John, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, would you please put one of us on your right hand and one of us on your left hand? In other words, the two positions of power and authority in the kingdom are on the right hand and the left hand. In, in, I, my mind just runs to these things. In, in the Old Testament, when you read the story of Naaman, when Naaman comes to get healed, he tells them that he is at the right hand of the king. He's the second most powerful person in the whole kingdom. So right hand, left hand in the kingdom, those are the two most powerful people. And they say, and evidently, they say it right in front. Imagine this, that you think you have some awkward people at where you were. Okay, imagine this. They say it, evidently, right in front of the other 10 disciples. So Jesus, when you come in your kingdom, back off, fellas. We'd like to be the two most powerful people in your kingdom because <laughs> those guys, those guys, pff, no way. You don't want to give them any kind of authority, right? And, and, and Jesus says to them, and it's so, uh, Jesus, he kind of plays the, well, they say, we've got something to ask you. Okay, guys, what is it? And they tell him. And he says, do you really think that you're ready for that? Do you really think you're ready to taste the cup that I'm about to taste? And they're like, uh-huh. Right? Because they have no clue. And then what happens? The other 10 are like, hey, hey, what about, you know, you can imagine. It just becomes this whole thing. Sometimes we think of those disciples, you know, we, we, we can swing from side to side. We can say they're a bunch of dopes. And then we can just say, well, they seem to all get along. And it's somewhere in the middle because sometimes they didn't get along and sometimes they really were dopes. So, so Jesus says, no, you're not, you're, you, don't know what you're you don't know what you're saying. And then he tells them, the sitting at the right and the left is appointed by God. You don't ask for it. It is appointed by God, just like with a high priest. Another great illustration of this, too, I think, is, is um, this whole idea that God often picks people that we would not pick. We would not pick. You know, I mean, you look, look, look at Peter. He denied Jesus three times. In Jesus' Jesus's weakest moment, his trial, his life is on the line. And, and you can imagine those other disciples. 
you know, thinking about who's going to be in charge. They say, yeah, well, we did kind of run away, but Peter hung around and denied him three times to a little girl. <laughs> Not him. And what happens? We see Jesus, you know, in John, we looked at this in the book of John, Jesus meets Peter and walks through those through three denials and reverses them and says, you're the leader I'm looking for. You're the leader I'm looking for. He's not the leader we would look for. When Paul and Barnabas went on one of their uh, missions trips, they took John Mark with them. And we are told in the book of Acts that at one point things are getting a little dicey and John Mark runs. He deserts them and he runs away. He goes home. And Paul, you know, he... he Paul is a unique person in scripture. And so this time, it's time for the next missions trip. And Barnabas comes to Paul and says, uh, I think we should take John Mark. I think we should take John Mark. Let's take him along. I think he's changed. I think he'll do a good job. And Paul is now, this is the reversed Mosley version, the RMV. Paul is like, well, let me think about it. No. Right? Paul's like, he's a deserter. He left us. Do you remember that? He left us. You're crazy. You think you see something good in him. Barnabas, you have an overdeveloped rescuer complex. His, he's a loser. He deserted us in our time of need. And, and in the actual verse there, he uses a very strong word for desertion, to leave people hanging in the lurch when they are, you're needed the most. And, Paul, and Barnabas says, Paul, I'm sure. We need to take him. I'm sure of it. And Paul says, you know, you're a misguided, bleeding heart, liberal, softy. I say no. And Barnabas says, okay, well, I'm taking him on my own. And Paul says, bye, Felicia. <laughs> and they split. They split. It says that the, the argument was so strong that they went separate ways because Paul is like, the guy deserted us. That's it for me. I'm done with him. Except he wasn't. A few years later, Paul writes in one of his letters, bring Mark to me. I need him. And that's as close as you'll get to an apology from the Apostle Paul, I think, maybe. He just says, bring Mark to me. I need him. See, God has this. He picks leaders that we would never pick. He chooses. We have to remember that in just as we live life, as we deal with people. Sometimes God does things in the most incredible ways, ways we would never do it. And so Jesus, he said over and over in his ministry on earth, God has selected me for this. God has appointed me for this. John 6, he says, I have been sent by the Father. I do what the Father called me to do. And so we see here that there is a solidarity that is required to be the high priest. There is a selection to be required. And we see Jesus. Now, he's going to go through these four things. He's gonna, then he's going to repeat them sort of in a different way and show us that Jesus fulfilled each one. And we can see that as we go along. So he says there's a sympathy that's required. It says the high priest, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. Now this, this deal gently is this idea. He knows how it feels. So he's able to deal gently. But the Greek word for gently, and I, I know sometimes I bring you these words, uh, matriopatheo, this Greek word is, is two words kind of brought together to make one word. And it means it's, it was used in, in a lot of times... Um, with Greek scholars, this idea of being balanced, not being extreme to one side or the other. See, the priests, if you think about it, they're dealing with people who have sinned. They're dealing with people's sins day in and day out. They're seeing all their failures. And it's easy, it would be easy to get incredibly angry and just be like Paul was with Mark. You're worthless. It would be easy to do that. Or it would also be easy to just say, it's okay, fine. Yeah, okay, I've heard it a million times. You're, okay, it's fine. To just quit, to just give up, to just say, be indifferent. To be exceedingly angry or just to be lazy and indifferent. Those are the extremes. And he says, no, you have to be in the middle. Now think about the, what the middle would be. 
it would be this. He can't condone what they did, but as a fellow human being, he can deal with sympathy in a way that is loving and yet pushes them towards righteous living. See, that's the middle ground. That's what the high priest is supposed to do. And Jesus illustrates this multiple times in his life. The, the easy one is, is John chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery. They bring this woman up, woman up to him, and they want to track, uh, trick Jesus into a trap. And they say, we caught her in the act, which, right? What's the first thing we ask? Where's the guy? We caught her in the act. Yeah, so where's the guy? He was there too, I assume, right? They didn't, see, that just showed right from the get-go what their motivation is. They could care less about what the law said. They just wanted to trick Jesus. So we know the fix is in. And they bring this woman forward. And Jesus, you know the story, most of you know, he writes in this, and he says, okay, whoever, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone, and they start wandering away. And he looks at her, and now think about this balance. Think about this balance that, that the high priest is supposed to have. He looks at her and says, where are your condemners? Where are the people who condemn you? And she says, they're gone. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He struck the balance, the balance. And he said, okay, you know what? I'm not here. I know this was a setup. I know you're just a pawn. I'm not condemning you, but hey, don't do this anymore. This is not right. This is not honoring to your body. This is not honoring to who you are or to who God is. And so he says, you gotta have that balance as he deals because some are ignorant and some are going astray. Some just don't really even, it's overwhelming. They don't even understand sometimes what they're doing or even why they're doing it. And you gotta help them to come out of that ignorance and understand. Some are going astray. That word meant they were, they were willfully going astray. They were saying, this is what God wants me to do and I'm gonna go over here, right? And he says, and then you gotta deal with them too. So you've gotta be that balance that's what the high priest has to have. And because of the cross, we get love. We get mercy. But through the word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God pushes us. He changes us. He refines us. He challenges us. There's that balance that has, that's a part of the high priest. Here's the fourth one. Uh, the requirements to be the high priest, solidarity, selection, Sympathy and sacrifice. I'm very proud of those five, four S's. I just want you to know that. <laughs> sacrifice is required. Every high priest is selected from among the people, is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. He's the mediator to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Throughout the Old Testament, God uses visuals to show the severity of sin and the extravagance of his love for his people. You know, we, we, we've looked at a number of the Old Testament books and, and, and looked at how God shows that in very way, various ways. He shows pictures of the severity of sin, and then he shows these incredible pictures of his extravagant love for his people. In the book of Hosea, he talks about the severity of the sin, and Hosea's wife leaves him, and he says, go and love her. Tell her you love her, because that's how I am with you. I have this extravagant love for you. And God pulls that book from a story between a man and a woman into a story between God and his people and how much he loves them as they leave him, as they spit in his face, as they, as they you know, walk away from him without a care. And he says, I still love you. I still love you. And so God uses these visuals and the sacrificial system that was in the Old Testament is the biggest vision. It's huge. It just shows in such, a, in such a powerful way the severity of sin and the love that God has for them. But then he gave them little things to do that also. He told them, put a tassel on your prayer shawl. Put five knots in it, five books of the Bible, five books of Torah, and, and, and you wear it on your prayer shawl. Oh, I, I put it, okay, here we go. I forgot. <laughs> okay, and you can see, see the tassels. And they're right at about hand length. And he tells them, he tells them, this is to remind you that I am the Lord your God, that I have given you these, 
these laws for righteousness and that you as my child are to obey. And they wear them right at hand length. So as they walk, they brush against them. Oh, there's my dad. Oh yeah, I'm God's. I'm supposed to live for him. He uses these visual reminders all the time to show the severity of sin and to show his extravagant love for them. And then, you know, like so many things that are visual reminders, what happened? Then we see Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And we say, you wear your tassels long, longer than anyone else. Why? Look at me. Look how holy I am. Look how special I am. Look how good I am. Look how righteous I am. And it becomes perverted. And throughout the Old Testament, what are we dealing with? God paints these pictures for his people, and they pervert them. And they run from them. So these reminders, especially on the Day of Atonement, remind them that they are insufficient and that someday the Lamb of God will come to take away the sins of the world, a once-for-all sacrifice. The ultimate high priest will do this. And now I want you to see the writer's going to kind of pivot here. This is, is interesting as you read this in, in, in this chapter. And no one takes this honor on himself. Yeah, they have to be appointed. But he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. Now, this, you're in a court case, right? You're in a court case, and, 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 and maybe the lawyer is arguing. And all of a sudden, while the lawyer is arguing, you know, think about this. If you can, all of a sudden, while the lawyer is arguing, you go, oh, he just undid his argument. He just made a mistake. He just made a mistake. Because here's, think about this. He says, as Aaron did, Aaron the high priest, no one takes this, you, you have to, it's given to you, and you have to be from the tribe of Levi, from the house of Aaron, to be a priest. Now, Scripture tells us that Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's a king. Oh, okay, well, so a prophet can be from any tribe. A king has to be from the tribe of Judah. And for the Messiah, he has to be from the house of David. For the Messiah, he has to be from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David. A priest has to be from the tribe of Levi, but only from the house of Aaron. You see the problem here? You can't be a king and a priest at the same time. The Old Testament, God set up checks and balances for, for the people of Israel. And one of them was, the king can never be a priest and a priest cannot be the king. Now, King Saul tried to do it. He tried to do a priestly duty and God punished him for it. King, king Uzziah tried to do a priest, priestly duty and God punished him for it because God said, no, it's separate. And so now the writer mentions Aaron by name and anybody who would be listening to this would go, okay, there's a problem here. Jesus is not a Levite. He's not from the house of Aaron. And this is where he makes, in the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, suddenly, there's a change here. It's like, bum, 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 bum. Everybody in the courtroom's like, oh, right? And the pe people who, said, who thought they saw a flaw in the lawyer, lawyer's argument, they go, oh, we got him now. Oh, what, did he say Melchizedek? Darn it, you know? <clears throat> Curses, you fiend. Right? So he says here, he says to them, first of all, there is this choosing. There is a selection here. And this is a picture that helps us see Jesus fulfills being in the high priest. He is selected by God. This is from uh, Psalm 2. It's a messianic psalm. And God says today, you are my son. And today I have become your father. I select you. And then the next one is from Psalm 110. And he says in, in another place, you are a priest forever in the order. Is it Psalm 95? I forgot. I didn't write it down. But anyways, it doesn't matter. It's in the Psalms. He says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Mel Melchizedek. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem, and here's how it's being addressed. He says, there's another priesthood. There's another high priest 
that's not in, the, in Aaron's house. And that's Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, we, we meet him in Genesis 14, just in two, in uh, a couple of verses. And then the writer of Hebrews is going to dive into him more. We'll look into him more. But Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Now, remember, this is, this is before Exodus. This is way back. This is Abraham. And a man comes along, and he's the king of Salem, which nowadays is known as Jerusalem. He was the king of Jerusalem before Jerusalem was Jerusalem. He was the king of peace. So he's the king of Salem, and it tells us he's a priest of the Most High God. He's ministering and mediating as a priest before there was a priesthood. We're told in, later in Hebrews, he, it's saying he has no father, he has no mother, there's no genealogy. He's a perpetual priest, no beginning and no end. So, so for many people, they look at that and they say maybe that is Jesus Christ appearing in person to Abraham. And maybe it is. But at the very least, it's a type of Jesus. It shows us it's pointing forward to when Jesus will come. There is coming someone who is eternal, someone who is a king, someone who is a priest, someone who brings peace, who has no beginning and no end end. And so the writer says, I know what you guys are thinking. You think you got me on this whole ironic deal. Well, I got you because I'm, we're going to Melchizedek. That's who Jesus is. That's who his line of priesthood. He's superior to any of the priestly line. Why? Because he was before them. Melchizedek was before them and Jesus was before them. And Jesus is a king and a priest, just like Melchizedek. And we need both. We need both. We need a king and we need a priest. In Isaiah 59, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. What is that? That is people who need a priest. They need a priest. And then also in, later in Isaiah 59, it says, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. And he starts to describing, those are people who need a king. They need a king. And that's what Jesus is. He comes because we need him. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus, now this is reference, referencing um, when Jesus went to uh, Gethsemane, and he went to pray, remember, and he took a few of the disciples with him, and he said, pray with me, please pray with me. And we see in Mark, Mark mentions something, Mark uh, says that he has, it, it, it literally means he's terrified and he has deep agitation of his soul deep inside. What, what's going on? Jesus now suddenly, and, and I understand we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about what's going to happen and, and, and our, our minds can't always imagine or, or comprehend what's going on. But in some way, I, I think of it this way almost, is that Jesus has known he was going to die, but now it's time to die. And he knows he's going to take on the sins of the whole world. He's looking into the mouth of hell, about to go there. And it's terrifying because he's like us. He's like us. And, he's, and I, I love this. I love that he felt that. He knows, he knows terror. He knows terror. And the word there for deeply agitated is this word of being torn apart inside. I said we're going through a spell of deep water. We have people who are being torn apart right now in our church. And, and we pray and we beseech the Lord. But still, Jesus knows how it feels. He's been there. He's experienced it. He knows how it feels. And so it tells us, it's very interesting, it tells us 
that he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And Scripture writes that. Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, Jesus is going, I see what's coming. Is there anything we could do different? Is there? And the answer is no. And so he says, nevertheless, your will, not my will. Your will, God, not my will. And so it tells us, son though he was, okay, even though he was God's son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He experienced it. He experienced it. And once made perfect, he made this perfect thing, this salvation. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He became the ultimate sacrifice and he accomplished our salvation. Eternal salvation to all who obey him. He was selected to be that high priest from the line of Melchizedek. And I want to tell you something. Don't miss, don't miss what God is trying to tell us here. You know, the thing about this can be, I mentioned this before, the thing about this can be is this, you can be like, okay, this is interesting. Okay, I didn't know about Melchizedek. Okay, cool, cool, cool. No, there's so much more than that. So much more than that. Because what has he been telling them? He's been telling them how important Jesus is. He's been telling them that there is a rest that is available to people who follow Jesus Christ. So he's telling them now, he's telling them now, this is the one who has the rest, and this is why he has the rest for us. This is why it's available. Understand that. Because for, for, for many people, you're, maybe you're not walking through deep water right now, but it will come, and you will need this, because this is who it was written to, people like that. And he's telling them, Look to Jesus. Remember a couple times ago we were saying he mentioned a couple of times. Today, 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 right now, immediately. Don't put this off. Look to Jesus. Focus on Jesus. He's, he's higher than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's this great eternal high priest who is now our mediator because he became a man. Jesus now is before God. And I screw up sometime, let's say, very rarely. And I screw up. And the accuser is, says, God, look at him. He is not one of yours. He's worthless. Look at him. He screws up. He screws up rarely. <laughs> I'm not going uh, And Jesus steps forward, my mediator. And he says, Father, it has been paid for. That sin has been paid for. I've taken care of it. I experienced the punishment in his place. And God says, case closed. Now, I'm making a real hash of that. I'm, there's much more than that involved, in, but in, just a bottom line kind of thing. This is our standing. So the bottom line is this. Don't miss this great salvation. Don't miss this rest he has for those who live for him. One of the biggest fallacies I think we face in our culture is that people will say, and I've heard this, I've heard this, people saying to me, when I was five, I came forward. I accepted Christ as my savior. I don't really remember it, but my parents said I did. So Bob, don't worry. I'm good. And let me tell you, that is walking on thin ice. And I am not the person that can tell anyone whether they are a believer in Jesus Christ or not. But I can tell you this. If since that day you walk forward, there has been no growth in your life spiritually, you are really on thin ice. Because the writer of Hebrews is dealing with those kinds of things. He's saying, hey, Maybe today's a good day to get things right with God. Maybe today's a good day to accept Christ as your Savior. Or maybe today's a good day to confess some things, to admit that you've been wrong about some things, to say I'm going to deal with some issues with some people that I've been putting off but I need to deal with. Maybe today's a good day for that. 
Because these things, whether it's dealing with things and dealing with people or whatever, these are the ways you get to that rest, by doing what's right in God's eyes, by following him as an obedient child. So today is a good day to make a decision like that. Today's also a good day to eat chili. It's just the stupidest thing I think I've ever said at the end of a sermon. Let me do this. Let me pray, and then we'll talk about the chili for just a moment. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you have provided this salvation through your son Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can change from the inside out. And you work that in our lives as we are in your word, as we yield to you, you through your spirit, you work and you change us. Father, help us as followers to leave this place. Help us to go and to be the kind of people who love and show mercy and meet needs wherever we may go. Father, we'll have opportunities coming up too with Port and with, with, with Angel Tree to meet needs of the least of these. God, help us to be looking for those opportunities wherever we go, when we go to work, when we go to school, we go home to be people who meet needs, who love others, who show the difference that Jesus makes in the lives of someone who's yielded to him. Help us to do that, Lord. And we, we will give you the praise because now we can have this eternal life, this Zoe life that you made us for. In Jesus' name, amen.